Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Friday. This is Arif Qureshi with ICS, and thanks for joining our COVID convo. Uh, we're kind of excited to talk about a lot of different things. There's been a lot of change over the last week, a lot of additional information. Um, so again, following our agenda today, uh, we'll have Fred Nolan talk a little bit about some of the funding pieces uh, and some of the allocations. I think that'll be helpful for a lot of districts that are on, online here. Um, we'll also jump right into with our superintendents from the different school districts, from Bemidji, Mora, um, Annie Central, uh, along with Brenda now with uh, Nashua Kiwaden. We will at that point then kind of stop for Q&A. So again, if you have any questions, please use the chat uh, and send your questions in and Aaron will kind of monitor that. Uh, we also have Jeremy Kovash, the Executive Director from Lake Area Co-op is all on. He will specifically be discussing uh, exactly what, uh, can, if others can go on mute, please. Um, if uh, he'll be discussing specifically kind of the activity involved with the service co-op. Um, and we're also really excited to have Neil Carlson from the University of Minnesota and Todd Rapp, our communication specialist. Uh, most of you should have received, we do have this, there's a really nice checklist Todd put together for COVID communication for all the school district. It is on our website uh, in the COVID section. Uh, you can pull that up. It's a great checklist to make sure you, you're covering all your bases. Um, we'll end with some additional resources that are available for all of you uh, with Fred Nolan, and then we'll open it again uh, with a chat room so we can answer any additional questions you may have. Uh, so with that, let's move forward to the next step. And Fred Nolan. Yes, the big news in funding uh, this past two weeks has been the Cronus Virus Relief Funds, known as CRF. Um, this was announced on July 30th by the governor with a formula, but there hadn't been any runs until this week. And this comes from the original CARES Act uh, passed by Congress uh, in the first weeks of the pandemic in March. Um, the expenditures must be a result of COVID-19 public health emergency. They cannot cover other federally funded uh, programs. And the other key thing is they must be expended out the door, not just encumbered by December 30th. Next slide, please. Comes in two separate pieces, although the, the, the line between these is, is, uh, is flexible when you make application. But the first is the largest amount is for operational costs. These could be sprayers, screening, personal protective equipment, um, increased cost for transportation, uh, ventilation, uh, maintenance, and upgrades. Uh, that would be considered operational, not necessarily capital expenses. All of these are operational expenses uh, that would be due to the COVID pandemic. Next slide, please. Then there's um, a category for, for uh, various support for families, students, and educators. They actually have this in two subcategories. I was kind of confused, wasn't clear what they were, but again, they said those, those categories are flexible when you come to actually making your application and doing your expenditures. One of the first things is a new concept called digital navigators. Uh, this has been uh, talked among um, technology folks for people who actually go to the home with masks and help families get their technology working, get them um, online, make sure they understand how to work the equipment. Um, they suggest you hire people in, the, in, in cultural uh, awareness or of the same culture. Uh, you may want to consider uh, young people for this uh, because they're usually pretty good at technology and um, hopefully they can, you can teach them how to explain things. There's all other kinds of things, tutors, translation services. A key one here is child care for essential workers. Since you're mandated to do child care for essential workers, this would be an, a, a, a allowable use of these funds. And then anything on professional development to get the educators ready, both for hybrid learning and for distance learning. Um, next slide. Okay, here's a bunch of links that um, when you get the PowerPoint, you can use. First, you can find your, your CRF, ESSER, and GEARS allocations here. And then learn more at the MDE Back to Better PowerPoint. They actually did a very good job explaining. Unfortunately, that conference was not well attended uh, for a whole variety of reasons, um, but that PowerPoint is there. Um, now you have to actually apply for these funds as an allocation grant. They're not gonna come to you through SERVs. So you have to go to the grants portal and actually get, that's where you find your application. 
As of Monday and Tuesday, the application was not there. They said they needed the executive council to make approval of that, um, which is the governor and secretary of state, et cetera. I would hope it's there by now, um, but you need to check back. They also said keep checking back at their MDE CARES webpage. And finally, if you have any questions, the two presenters, Andrea Prawl and Michael Dietrich, they're good, detailed people. I've worked with both of them. They emphasized, email them if you get stuck or have questions. And lastly, don't forget, those funds have to be expended. Board approved, checks written, sent by December 30th. And they will be monitoring us to see how we are on progress. And if we're not making progress, if you haven't had a certain percent of funds expended by a certain date and it's all in that PowerPoint, they're gonna start, start recollecting those funds and redistributing them. So um, this is pretty serious stuff. It's great uh, funding. If you've looked at the numbers, they're significant. I mean, 244 million is like putting uh, two or 3%, two, more than 2% on the formula for one year. So it's a considerable amount of money. Um, it's great that the governor allocated this for schools and for kids and education, because it was really up to him kind of how to allocate this um, in many ways, based on the 150 billion for schools, uh, but they did make allocations, I mean applications and allocated it this way. So if you have any questions, um, please ask Andrea and Michael, they know a lot more about it than I do, uh, but this is a top of your list now. Uh, for your funding uh, for CARES, then GEARS, and then uh, ESSER, because those have longer timelines to expend and to make application. So with that, we'll move on to Tim Lutz in Bemidji. Thank you, Fred. I'm Tim Lutz, superintendent of the Bemidji School District, and we've had a very busy week. Um, you know, I guess I would like to just start off on, on what Fred was talking about with these new funds and how we need to spend them what that means for the Bemidji School District is uh, well over a million dollars and we are very appreciative of that amount of funding, but we're also a little bit nervous about how to get it spent in a timely fashion, so we're focusing on that. And for the initial thoughts that Bemidji has for spending some of these dollars, we do need some HVAC upgrades. We've been working on that all summer, taking a look at our buildings and some filter upgrades, so right away that's where a large part of our, part of our funding will probably go. In addition, technology, we, uh, I like the idea of those technology experts going into homes because we have a lot of intergenerational families and because they are intergenerational, many of those students are staying at home because of concerns with grandma's health. And if grandma's the main caretaker, grandma might not be the most adept at technology. So there is going to be a need for that help. So we're going to explore that we also have purchased a number of Chromebooks. Um, we're purchasing external cameras for teachers to use on their laptops in order to do distance learning and hybrid distance learning. Some touch-free pads for food service. Um, we're looking at additional PPE, some additional signage and barriers and sneeze guards that we need to put into place in all of our buildings. We had already ordered many of those, but some of those invoices are dated after July 1st, so they will qualify for this funding. Some of the changes that we have seen in the last week or so, our numbers uh, have gone down slightly, depending upon the day that, you know, it was down as low as 14, we thought last uh, Tuesday or Wednesday, but come the end of the week, those adjusted numbers that came out from the Department of Health are right around where they were last year, not a significant, last week, not a significant change. However, on the next slide, you can see an interesting graphic that includes a spreadsheet, we have been working with Beltrami County Public Health and asking them where they, where they get their data or how they send their data and whether or not we can see the raw data from the county. And they have been very good to work with. And they have agreed to send us some information that looks just like this every single day so that we can get the most current listing of active cases in the county and do our own averaging on a 14 day rolling average. And because they've broken it down by these age groups and we asked them to do it this way, so we could have our early childhood as one age group, our K through three schools as an age group, our fourth and fifth grade and middle school as, as a group in a high school, we can see exactly what we're looking at in terms of numbers and potential risk. 
And for me, it's encouraging to be able to see and to say that we probably will have one student at any given moment in the county, unless things change a lot, who is currently dealing with an active case of coronavirus, of COVID-19. And so it's very likely that our elementary schools, while still needing to practice all of the important hygienic and distance practicing and wearing of masks, it's more of a yellow alert than a red alert. Granted at the high school, a few more, but we're still talking only uh, five students of that age group who are potential with issues, um, five in the middle school and 13 between ages of 15 and 18. So that's where we're going to have to focus our energies and realize that we could have one or two students in, at each grade level at the high school who are currently dealing with COVID-19. Now that's for the whole county. So we don't even know if any of our buildings are dealing with these numbers, but it is good to know these numbers broken down like this and every day so we can have the latest information. So on the next slide, I can talk a little bit about um, our decision for our base model. We, uh, we are going to be recommending to the board on our, at our board meeting on Monday evening that our elementary students are all in school and our secondary are a hybrid model. And we are really trying to see this and communicate this as a best of both worlds situation. We have a lot of people who want their children in school. We have a lot of families who want their children at home. So we can accommodate that by making sure we really reach out and communicate that parents have that option of distance learning so we can meet the needs of everyone by doing it this way. Next steps for us are to communicate like crazy. One of the most important things we can do is get the word out. So many people are asking questions that we have collated numerous FAQ documents and we're working on reducing the redundancies in those questions and getting the answers out through a lot of different media, through radio, newspaper, uh, answering phone calls, through mass phone calls and email e-blasts. And I'm working on um, coming up with about once a week, we have a television studio at our high school and I'm gonna prepare and present a three to five minute video placed on YouTube. And we'll put that out on our websites just to humanize who we are and help build confidence in our system. We also have a great partnership with Sanford Health and Sanford Health doctors, their chief vice president and medical officer, Dr. Wilcox is confident that we can open our schools. He has mentioned that not a single staff member has caught COVID while on the job. And so we are hoping that we can emulate that. Now granted a school environment is different. Third graders running around playing at recess, wrestling with each other. That is different than a bunch of adults working on a medical staff but our medical professionals in the community are confident that we as a district can open safely. So one of the things we're going to do is ask all of our teachers and everyone else from every bargaining unit to submit questions that we can then submit to this doctor. He and I and a couple other district leadership members are going to be on a panel and we are going to record ourselves answering the most important questions that are submitted by our staff. We want to build confidence, ease anxieties, we're going to do the same thing with parents. Finally, we have a, an elementary school and a high school staff member. Both are really good at developing videos and they use the iVideo platform. I've asked them to create videos so that they can show parents what school is going to look like when students get off the bus, come into the doors, have their health checks, go to their classroom, go to lunch, go to recess. These teachers have their own children who will act as models in these videos and they are going to show parents exactly what's going to happen because that's what's happening now. Parents are asking these questions, what does this look like? So we're going to communicate like crazy now that we move forward with and have announced our plans next week. Finally, lots of meetings. That's all we seem to do, but meetings are another way to plan and to get the word out and to communicate. So we've had a busy week and we're expecting another very busy week next week. And Fred, I want to mention something else too real quickly. I'm dealing with a few questions that are related to the wearing of masks and parents are asking, you know, we've adopted a policy that stipulates that if a, if a child does have a pre-existing condition, either medical or emotional, mental, that precludes wearing of a mask, we are asking for a doctor's note so that we can verify that. But 
This parent is challenging me on that, saying she can't find anywhere in any of the executive orders or documentation that that is a requirement. And so I'm looking for some advice on how to handle parents like this when it comes to masks. Well, thanks for asking, Tim. I'm sure many superintendents and principals are facing this across the state. And the parent is correct. There is no requirement that you seek medical documentation. In fact, in the uh, commissioner's call in uh, last Thursday, they're very explicit that there's no requirement for that. They also, um, in this week's call, said MDH has no parameters about what is a medical condition of prevent wearing of masks. So there is really no authoritative place to go. But there's a, there's a window of opportunity of how to handle this that was revealed two weeks ago. And that is that um, if the student has um, a medical condition that prevents them wearing a mask and you just simply accept it, you don't ask for documentation, but just accept it. Now that student has an ADA uh, condition that requires an accommodation. And the accommodation that you can offer for someone not wanting to wear a mask is distance learning. Um, and so you don't have to go through discipline. You don't have to expel the student. You simply say, okay, we're, we're accepting prima facie on its face value that, that your child has a medical condition. You're now enrolled in distance learning because this parent wants it both ways. And you need to keep your people safe. And I think this is the way uh, to do it. So I actually would recommend you go back and change your policy and explain to the board why you're changing the policy, not requiring medical uh, certification, especially since you put the doctors in a really tough place. There's no authority they can go to. There's no uh, DMS book that they can look up and say, oh, this is what's, what, what's that? They're, they're at a loss as well. And so that is what I would recommend. And I'll also say to superintendents on the call and others that if, if you, you know, you're so busy, you don't have time to listen to the hour long conversation and there is a lot of fluff and stuff that's not that important. You can go to the ICS website and look uh, on the very first page under reopening is my blog, which I'm doing for ICS. And I cover this, I cover Pelsby, I cover basically anything that's moving in the state um, and can give you a quick update. And in fact, I'd like to say, um, I'll put in the chat the blog that has a link to Digital Navigator's um, uh, job descriptions. So you know more detail from a national organization how they're trying to define them. So I hope, Tim, this helps you and I actually hope it helps a lot of superintendents with this really sticky problem. The governor also said yesterday, don't try to defend this, put it on him. Say, hey, the governor said it, it's the law of the land, let him do it. Um, but allowing parents to, to claim a medical exemption gets you out of discipline. Because the next thing Darren Cordy said yesterday, two weeks ago, was it's the law of the land. If they don't wear it, start using your discipline policy. And I think allowing someone to declare a medical condition just gets you out of that whole discipline issue. So hope that helps, Tim. That does, Fred. Thank you very much. And that's it from Bemidji. Thanks. I can, I can talk about Mora's uh, position right now and what we've been doing and where we're hoping to go. Um, our initial thoughts for the funding, uh, we, we did double our transportation routes. So yesterday um, I was talking to our transportation people and uh, the bus drivers want to know how much more they're going to get paid for doing more routes. Um, we're going to be using more fuel, et cetera. So we're probably gonna to have to use a lot of our funding on transportation, but also we went through our list of things that we need to get in, in order to make sure that things are clean. Um, the sprayers, PPE, the technology, we're can, I think we're gonna go with the digital navigator. We, we struggle with connectivity in our, our area. So we think that's a valuable use of those funds. The other thing in regard to our numbers, what we're seeing here in, in Kanabic County, um, we are meeting weekly with our Kanabic County health partners and we, we have Wellia Health and they've um, been fantastic to work with. And it's been really helpful to get their perspective because we're not 
public health experts. So um, the MDE numbers are one thing, like Tim said, and the other is getting real numbers in real time. And they can pinpoint what is really going on within our, um, within our area. Uh, in, in Kanabic County, we have two main schools. One is um, Mora and the other is uh, Ogilvy. And so they, uh, Kanabic County Health can tell how many students, how many parents are impacted with COVID-19. You see the numbers here uh, seem to be pretty steady, uh, but the real time numbers are more like 8.4. And so, um, so that's really helpful to have those conversations. And we're like Tim, we've started to play out some of those scenarios, those what if scenarios, if, um, Something does happen and we have to switch models. What is that going to look like? You can go to the next slide, please. I just wanted to point out too, I, and forgive me, I don't know if this was said already, but that um, COVID relief fund, um, one thing is, you know, you can back up that money to July 1st. So if you've already spent a significant chunk of money and you want to just go ahead and spend your money so you don't have to worry about it in November, I'm just backing that up and, and recoding things that you've already spent money for in July is like a really good thing to do. Correct. Thanks, Brenda. Brenda, do you want to talk a little bit about our return to school plan? I'm sure. So we went through the process of um, developing our framework over the summer. And then I think our last Friday, we talked about how we had to adjust a lot of things when the um, guidance came out. Um, which we did, and then we did that in conjunction with staff, and man, very impressive work that the staff did in taking their own realm of responsibility, and then in conjunction with all the departments, coming up with a real comprehensive plan for our district. And so when we went to the board and we presented that to them, um, it, there weren't many questions because we had really looked at all the crevices, or we tried, of course, the board chair asked a super good question that we hadn't even thought of, which is going to happen. And so um, I, it, was a, it was very impressive that we were able to present that. Um, they approved it, and now we can move forward with all the details. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the question was about what are we going to do if we have a snow day? in the middle of a pandemic. Of course, it's August and we hadn't thought of snow yet. So we had a good, we had a good answer to that one. Another uh, good question that a parent brought up during the open session, and I, I guess my takeaway was, oh my gosh, there are going to be really great questions and we're going to have to rethink this like probably every day, some, some piece of it. And the other parent asked um, their child level four in a different county on a different calendar and we transport and are we going to use our county's number or that county's number and that you know he asked some really good detailed questions that we were like oh you know we hadn't thought about that piece so um yeah just some a little aha on that sure uh so at our board meeting uh one thing if you haven't had your board meeting i think it would be really helpful we had kanabic public health come and speak and talk a little bit about how they're working closely with the schools what type of information they're able to give how we would be using our our um, decision making trees when we go through that process of potentially switching models uh, we also had our district nurse there and uh, our local wellia Healthcare. Um, person that works closely with Kanabic Public Health. So I think that just add, added a level of uh, confidence in the decisions that we would be making moving forward. And so we at uh, Mora Public Schools approved the resolution that's uh, been sent out through MSBA to begin in-person learning if our, rate, if our rates remain close to uh, what they are. And of course, that resolution gives the superintendent authority to move between models without having a special board meeting. So looking ahead, um, just like everyone else, there's uh, a million and one details that we've already went through and there's a million and one more. I do appreciate that checklist. I walk through that. That'll be very helpful. Um, transportation, 
setting up the incident command team, funding HR employee stuff, health and safety, communications, and on and on and on and on and on. So uh, we just keep working through those questions. Um, and uh, of course, the other thought that's starting to come to the forefront is back to school planning. What's our new teacher workshop, our, our regular staff workshop and open houses, what are they gonna look like? So all that regular school stuff has kind of taken a back burner trying to plan for the, uh, the new uh, return to school plan. So I hope that information helps. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Andy Almos, uh, Superintendent of Schools at East Central. Um, it's been a busy week for us as well, just like the rest of the schools, uh, probably all across the country, getting, getting uh, ready to go for school. Um, like the other school districts, um, we've spent the last months and weeks uh, building frameworks for us to be able to reopen school in these three different models. But now we've moved into no longer building frameworks to really diving into the details. Um, you know, it, it, uh, our administrative team talks, you know, we uh, <laughs> affectionately call it playing whack-a-mole. Um, you know, as the, as the next problem pops up, we, we, you know, we try to figure it out and move forward and include it in our plans. And as the next problem comes up, we, we, do, we just keep doing it. So uh, glorified whack-a-mole, right? Um, as far as the coronavirus relief funds, um, we will be using that to uh, make sure we have enough PPE for all our people, including our teachers. We've told our staff, really, whatever they need, we'll try to get. So we want them to be comfortable. We want to support them. If they want more, if they want less, we'll, we'll, we're, we're there to help. Um, some of the classroom supplies and uh, uh, manipulatives that, that we normally share between classrooms and grade levels, we're going to use some of those funds to make sure we have enough so we don't have to share those and spread those uh, up and down the hallway. Making sure we have enough cleaning supplies. Um, one of the things I think uh, our district has done is in, in our elementary school, we've been moving away from desks and more into tables in our classrooms. Well, that's great, except it doesn't help support distancing uh, when you can't move those tables as far apart. So we're looking at barriers to attach to the tables to try to help us with that. Um, we intend to have our kids still eat in the cafeteria for lunch and breakfast. So we're looking at some type of outdoor seating on the nice days where the kids could go outside. Um, those doubling not only as lunchroom spaces, but also outdoor classroom spaces. Um, we, th we think that's important there to make sure that we get them outside as much as possible. Also for those mass breaks, um, as we talked about a little bit before. And then signage, making sure that when people come into the building, they feel like that this is a different place, even though we're gonna open in our, in our in-person model, it should feel different and look different. So some of that signage will be spent out of those funds as well. Um, you see our case rate data in front of you there, 3.09. Uh, we still remain very low and we have uh, since that May data, um, since you know, if you look back at the May data. Um, it's it's kind of refreshing. Uh, we, we, we have our public health meeting every week and we look at the data. Uh, public health, health could probably tell us exactly who the people are. Of course they don't, it's confidential, but they, uh, you know, we're, we're a county of about 30,000 people. So, you know, it's a small county um, and we right now are running about nine cases across the county. So when, when, when public health isn't overly nervous just yet, that's a good sign and we keep telling them that. Uh, we, want, we want that to be the case. So right now they're serving as a resource. Um, really it's, it's they're cautious and they're supportive and that's, that's the goal. Um, we, we are working with them just on the details of our plans, all those what ifs as the other superintendents talked about, you know, what's going to happen if we get a case in our school, what's our response going to be, what if Johnny's exposed because his dad had a, has, is confirmed to have COVID, what are we going to do, because those are the things that our staff want to know, our parents want to know, um, and th that's, that's a really important thing for us to be prepared to answer. As an administrative team, uh, alongside that partnership with public health, we've started looking ahead uh, with some tabletop drills for what happens if we have to switch models. What's our plan going to be? Are we going to take a day off of school? Do we feel confident just getting the data on Thursday and starting maybe on Monday with a new model? And what does that look like? So um, we've worked, started working through that. Also, those, those, those HR concerns, um, you know, trying to put a little more human in human resources and working with our staff to try to alleviate concerns. 
one of the things we say is that, you know, the administrators have worked through this for a number of months and we're starting to feel more comfortable with it, but our staff, many of them just now have to start to get comfortable with it. So how do we support them? Show them we have a plan, show them that they're going to be okay when we come back to in-person. We have some staff that are going to be considered high risk and we have some that are going to have high anxiety and there's of course a difference between the two. So what does that really mean? And overall, we want to be supportive of how they're feeling about all this. We have a board meeting Monday night. Uh, we are going to review the plans. Um, if there's no change to our data, we'll, uh, the board will take action to move forward with an in-person learning scenario. Because um, again, the data supports that and Pine County Public Health supports that reopening. Um, lots of details we continue to work through. Our distance learning details in, a, in our small district right now, we have 20 kids so far saying that they're gonna do distance learning. So it's really a small number, but I expect that number to grow every day as we get closer to school starting. So how many staff are we gonna dedicate? What's the expectations of those staff members in these models? Um, all of those details that all the schools are working, working through. Um, as Dan mentioned, workshop schedules, back, uh, new teacher back to school. What does this look like? How do we do this when we're going to try to avoid, uh, you know, being in the same room together as much as possible? Um, so we're shifting a lot of our workshop uh, information to videos. You know, my back to school message will be a video. The principal's uh, staff meetings, a lot of that we can videotape those, those more staff meeting items and put those out for people. Um, as we look ahead to what's coming up for us, um, just like everyone else has said, communicate, communicate, communicate. As we, as we play this whack-a-mole game, uh, we wanna make sure that uh, we communicate every time that we learn something different, every time our plan tweaks a little bit and make sure we put it out there. And again, support our staff. Um, and also I'll throw in there, build excitement for getting kids back to school. Uh, you know, we're posting pictures of some of the remodeling projects that we've put on to try to get kids excited about being back here and wanting to be back here because it's been a long time since they've been at school. So those are, uh, that's what we're trying to do looking ahead. It's going to be a busy week coming up next week too. Well, thank you, Soups. Um, that's really great. And I love the sense of humor, Andy, because I think we all need a sense of humor in these times and, and uh, whack-a-mole is a great, great uh, metaphor. And uh, also, uh, as you're all trying to build confidence and communicate uh, with your communities. Um, are there questions in the, in the chat? I'm not seeing them. Um, but if you're on and you got a question, we're, we're pausing now to uh, allow questions of any of the three superintendents. Um, anything that struck your interest? Well, seeing nothing, we can always stop and go from there. Um, let's bring on uh, Jeremy Kovash and, uh, from Lake Service Co-op. Um, okay, here's a question. Does anybody have a communication plan written out? So back to the three of you. Does anybody have a communication plan? I think Todd Rapp, why don't you also unmute because you made a presentation on this uh, maybe a month ago. But let's start with the superintendents first. We, we don't have one written out per se yet. Okay. Bemidji is working on one, but it's far from completed. We had a communication plan for the normal school year, and we're taking bits and pieces of that and tweaking it. We're doing the same thing with our emergency operations plan, trying to tweak it and, and apply it to the new normal. So it's, it's still a ways out before we're done with that communication plan. Backing up a few weeks ago in East Central, um, I had just, uh, I would say our, our communication plan that was in writing was dates that were sent to our, our managers of our different departments. And August 10th was a date that I wanted the principals to get their messages out and our, our activities director. So I didn't direct them about what they were going to communicate about, but uh, with all of the meetings that we've had, they, they knew where we were headed. And so many of them have issued those communications. Um, I'm not sure who asked the question, but all of, all of that information, our communication is archived on our website. So if you want to take a look at some of those, um, you can see it right in our reopening plans. Okay. And Todd, we just got a question about is there a template to use for a communication plan? Maybe this would be a good time to talk about your checklist as well. 
Yeah, a couple of things. First of all, yeah, we have put together a checklist of both the requirements that have come from the Department of Health and Department of Education, along with their recommendations and some additional recommendations from uh, RAP Strategies and ICS. Um, that's been, um, it's been sent out to a number of superintendents, to the cooperatives, and I think it's also on the ICS website. Um, that's a good place to start. Um, my advice in terms of a template, and we put together, a, a, it's part of the PowerPoint that's on the ICS website that I presented on COVID communications. Um, we, we put together a two week sample of how to stage your communications. And, and here's my advice for everybody. I mean, the, the communications that we're talking about today is different than what we were talking about a week ago or two weeks ago. And it's gonna be different what we, than we've talked about in a couple of weeks. So my advice is to plan out just a few weeks at a time. Don't try to put together an entire plan for the fall. Start with planning, what do we need to do for those few days when staff comes back, few days that students come back, or if they're not all coming back in, into the school, how you'll communicate with the parents and students remotely. And just work out in two week increments over time. The most important thing you can do right now, I think is to set up this relationship between your community members and yourself, particularly your parents, your staff and your students of how frequent the communication is gonna be. So they're looking for it. And just developing that habit that they're looking for additional information from you is fantastic. The other thing I'd throw in there, and I, and I really appreciate the, the comments that the superintendents were making, um, to, to end every week and maybe begin every week with either a quick blog or a quick video um, that, that, that really gives it, at the beginning of the week, it's what to expect. At the end of the week, it's what we saw and what maybe could happen next week. And it, it wouldn't take very much time to put that together. And again, if you, you're, you're helping um, convince your residents to develop the habit of looking for you from information, for information. And now they'll go to that and you can, and, and you can give them other places they can go for additional, um, for, 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 for additional data or additional information. Um, you know, it's really, it's just really, really important that they're turning to the school districts because if they're not, they're gonna turn elsewhere and probably given how fast things are changing, they're gonna end up getting false information. So that'd be my advice for now. You can also, if you want to, feel free to email me with any questions you have and I can handle those um, independently. Well, thanks, Todd. And Todd, of course, is uh, president of uh, Todd Rapp Communications and um, uh, is uh, working with ICS here and his uh, information is on the ICS site. So thanks, Todd. And do, do contact him if you have more, more questions. Other questions on the blog? I'm not seeing any. Well, we can always come back, um, but let's uh, let's uh, turn to Jeremy Kovash with Lakes Area Service Co-op and get an update from the service co-ops and the regional uh, response teams. Okay, thank you, Fred. Uh, first of all, just to, um, you know, the first thing I would have from a regional response team is continue to talk to your local departments of health, um, uh, your, your public health departments in your counties are a great resource. Um, the service cooperatives and the statewide teams, we do have planning sessions set for next week. And then there are calls that all of you should be on uh, the 24th and 25th uh, of August that you will learn more about your work with your regional response teams, which will include a member of the service cooperative, uh, one uh, testing coordinator who will help you with testing and one of those tests they will help you with is sal our saliva tests that are coming out uh, and I don't have the details on that yet but you will have some access to saliva tests and then also um, um, also uh, the two epidemiologists and they will be the ones to help guide you or give you some information or details or help you to make the decision regarding uh, your, your uh, distance learning or hybrid models uh, or in or, or face to face. So um, that's the details that I have. Uh, the PPE equipment delivered by the Minnesota National Guard is set to come to the cooperatives 
uh, on or after next Friday, the 21st. So I'm kind of anticipating that early in the week of the 24th to arrive at each of the service cooperatives. And um, I believe that you as superintendents around the state are, uh, that'll be sorted for you and you will come and pick that up. So uh, plan on finding a suburban or depending if you're, if you're Tim and you're Bemidji, that might be a couple suburbans uh, to do that. And I'm not sure again, in, in, in your case, Tim, if, if Bruce will get that delivered to two sites because I know you can have, have uh, uh, meetings in Bemidji and, and Thief River. So probably uh, regional response teams uh, in partnership with, with MDH, uh, MDE, and uh, all of you are school district members. Okay, well, thank you, um, Jeremy. I appreciate that. And uh, again, we'll continue to chat, look for comments. Um, but let's bring on uh, Neil Carlson uh, from the University of Minnesota and environmental health. And Neil, uh, what comments uh, do you have for the, for the, for the, for the folks? Well, I, I appreciate, I think people are, are being thoughtful and planning and listening to public health professionals. And I think that's gonna be a, a appropriate a couple of things that came out, at least from a research perspective of this past week that was interesting is that they're getting more and more data that indicates that there are some cons more concerns with aerosol transmission and that they're seeing some viral particles from a patient in a very well-designed uh, hospital room with six air changes per hour UVC and they're still seeing some projection of the viral particles that can be uh, cultured or at least activated uh, several like 14 to and seven and 14 feet away from that spot. So I think we need to keep an eye on that data. And the, the main question is, is there enough particles that are of that type that can be uh, infectious and can cause disease? And we don't know that data yet. The second one that came out is interesting. They did the uh, a study on some different cloth mask type, and they're finding that the bandana types and the uh, uh, or the ones that fit over your face, like a, 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 a I don't know what you call it, a, 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 a baklava or something like that. This yeah. type of mask. Neil, it's a, it's a neck gator. A neck, a neck, gator. neck gator, and they don't work very well at all. In fact, one of the easy ways that I'm starting to develop and we're just doing a little bit of study on it is instead of all this complicated testing, put a candle 12 inches away from your face and if you can blow on it and blow the candle out, the mask that you're wearing is not protective. Very simple, just put a candle, go and if it goes out, you aren't protecting. I've done it with some cloth masks and uh, we have a group that's at the U that's made over 2,000 cloth masks. The cloth mask, the candle will not go out when you blow. But some of these really cheap, really cheap, uh, commercially available knit uh, face coverings aren't working at all to protect other people. So I think this is kind of the next level of what we need to think about. And I think it's really hard from, from an enforcement standpoint to do it, but if people are concerned about protecting other individuals, that's a very simple test that they can use to find out, am I wearing something that's actually gonna protect somebody or not? That's a great uh, idea with a, with a candle. And Neil, we've got a question that's come in, I think you're the best to handle it. Um, the, the person is talking about, um, the doctor mentioned me that one of her two children came home with exposure has been quarantined, but also that the necessity for children, students to receive a regular flu shot. Now, normally adults receive flu shots. Are we, are we, are we gonna do flu shots for children as well? What, what, what's the reading on flu shots going into the, into, uh, the school year? Uh, I, I'm not 100% up on it, but when I, I had my child all, every, every year, I had her take a flu shot, so there's, there might be a, uh, a specific drop off where the, uh, you know, they're too young to get it, but that after a certain age, if it's recommended, I definitely think flu shots would be a, a key to it. Public health officials have been all in support of, of that because the symptoms overlap 
And if we can at least have a chance of knocking down the flu a little bit, we've got a chance of people going forward so that they can provide care. The other real worst case scenario, if an individual comes down with both simultaneously, uh, there's a real high likelihood that there'll be ser serious health consequences associated with that. And uh, I've got some individuals that I know not associated with just the flu, but just have very young who've had very severe reactions to the COVID uh, virus. So I, I, I think we need to really take this seriously. And Fred, I can, I can add to that, that in Bemidji, we've been working with Sanford Health and public health as well. And they really do want to have flu shots again. And they would like our schools to work with them so that these clinics can be held at our schools to get add more capacity. Again, for what Neil said, that they, the, both of those illnesses, COVID and the flu shot, and flu can work against each other and compound and make one worse. On top of that, if we can minimize people catching the flu, which is probably still not likely because we're kind of trading the flu for COVID this year, according to our doctors. But if we can prevent people from catching the flu and then thinking they have COVID, that would also be a great public service. So we're going to be working with our health service on that. Also, I should mention that um, our health community, our Sanford Health Specialists, the hospital and clinic, they have 2,000 thermometers on hand that they're oral thermometers. They're not very useful anymore for them at the clinics or the hospitals. They've offered to donate them to us in the school district so we can get them out into the hands of families who may not have thermometers. There are probably families that don't have a single thermometer. And if we're asking them to monitor their children today, that's something we need to make sure they have in their households. So I would suggest to people that in your communities, reach out to your healthcare services, work together in any possible way, because we've been really fortunate with our partnership with Sanford Health and the county here in Beltrami County. Wonderful. And um, two things. One, Arif just put in that um, it's recommended that a, a over six months, children should have a flu shot. Um, but also make sure in your communication that this is an opportunity for a flu shot. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Mueller uh, on yesterday's call was very clear to say that um, a testing event in your community for COVID doesn't mean kids and faculty are gonna be required to be tested. I guess there's a rumor out on social media she was trying to um, knock down. So when you make a communication about the opportunity to have a flu shot, this just makes it easier. The kids are at school. Um, you still would need the permission slip, all that kind of thing, because it's a family decision. And um, uh, Belinda, I would go back to your public health with this conversation. I'm, I'm surprised uh, with your comment that they wouldn't want to hold a flu uh, clinic um, in school like they've done in the past. But um, I think uh, this is a good, good question. Thanks, you can uh, for, for, for sending that in. Um, we have a question, Neil, for what is the recommendation for screening questions? And are you recommending temp checking uh, when uh, students, assuming when students and staff arrive at the school? Uh, the screening questions, are the MBH and also the CDC, and we can, we can post them later in the, in the talk, but they have some very specific uh, screening questions that they have. And the screening questions keep changing the more they know about the virus. So the initial screening questions they had a couple months ago have shifted over to some of the, uh, some of the other symptoms they've had, like loss of taste, loss of smell, a couple other ones. And they've been very restrictive now because uh, I was working with uh, at least the health partners group, and there is a shortage again of some of the, the, the high quality uh, PCR swabs, so they're re restricting individuals as far as testing. Now, this may be different in schools where they're going to be switching over to maybe some of the saliva testing, but uh, that that's also a piece that, that's going into it. So as far as the temperature monitoring, a lot of different ways you can approach it. The university is having individuals do it at home. I think uh, School districts can also choose to either have an infrared thermometer, um, oral thermometer, which we require people to take the mask off. It's typically a little bit more accurate. 
They also, if you've got extra funds from your COVID uh, file, you can get some infrared screeners where you, it'll, you just put your face in and it'll tell the temperature. The ones we've had so far that we've tested out have been a mixed bag. So I, I can't give you a, a, a full throated recommendation on that or not with respect to that. Okay. Um, let's go back to the three superintendents. Are you planning on um, doing the screening questions and temp checking or are you gonna rely on the parents and their assurance that the students are healthy getting on the bus and coming to school? What are, you, what are your thoughts and your plans on that? I can start. Uh, we, are, we are not planning to temperature check everybody. Uh, just given the fact that, uh, you know, our buses come all at the same time, we don't have tiered busing. So they would be lined up at the door and probably standing too close together knowing, knowing kids. Um, so we're, those screening questions like in our elementary school will come during morning meeting. Um, and the other screening questions, questions would come during first hour uh, with our high school. And uh, um, so, and then we're going to ask parents to check temperatures before they send them to school. Yeah, and for Mora, we are not going to be temperature checking either. We're going to start educating our parents on that. Um, we'll, we will be doing some screening questions and things like that. That was a recommendation from County Health. So, um, so that's our plan, is to educate and communicate with parents. And the same is true with Bemidji. We're going to uh, actually be implementing a screening system through Skyward. And so, and this will be, we're starting to run it as a trial run with all of our staff who are 12 month staff. And uh, you can either do it on your computer with Skyward or on a, a phone app or with paper and pencil, but uh, it's, it's very simple to do on, a, on an app or on a computer. And we're asking parents if at all possible to do it with, with this Skyward app and to uh, have our staff do that as well. And we're hoping that that will also help us with our contact tracing down the road too, if that ever comes to that point. Yep. Well, okay. Um, this is great. Uh, we've got a little nice joke from Lyndon Olson from Worthington, longtime board member, real advocate for kids. Uh, Tim, you might want to check the chat uh, for his for his joke. But I do want to bring to uh, superintendent's attention, again, if you are unable to attend the Back to Better conference, Susan Klammer, who is the MDH epidemiologist assigned to MDE, uh, she was the keynoter and she has a very good presentation. Her PowerPoint is full of links to the actual source material, uh, similar to what Neil Carlson has been looking at. And um, you can find a summary in my blog there. And if you have time just to read one study, uh, it would be the, she recommends a New, Jer New England Journal of Medicine School Reopening Research Synthesis both because it's, it's in a readable format um, and makes a moral case for what we're trying to do, um, knowing the health, the health situation. Um, because as the leader in the community, the governor yesterday said, you are the ones who can bring confidence to the community, the community looks to you, you can bring people to the table. So you really need to be knowledgeable in the basics of the science here. Um, I think her recording is available to you on the MASA website. I have not looked on it in the member site, but uh, they said the recording was going to be there. And also they had a presentation from Meredith Vadis, who is the chief operating officer for the uh, testing work group that will actually be supervising the testing people in the regions. Okay, so uh, her such thing was on the different kinds of tests why tests, what not tests. She has a little video about what a testing event looks like in a community. Um, and so it was a good background uh, information piece. So again, I think the recording, and there was a lot of information orally about insurance in the recording, uh, I would look for that. But um, I understand everybody was really busy, uh, but these were some resources in the Back to Better conference that I think I would like to bring to your attention. Um, and have for you as a resource. And um, next slide, I think we're to the end here. Yep, back to you, Arif. Yep, thanks a lot, Fred, and thank you everyone, especially the panelists for pulling this together. 
again, just a reminder for everyone that we will be doing this every week and there's gonna be some additional updates that are, will be coming out also. And I know that uh, there was a lot of requests for the communication chess checklist and that is on our website. You should be able to download that. Um, I think a few final things, just make sure you take advantage of the CFR. Um, the funding's available. Uh, it needs to be again used up by end of December. Um, and then also, uh, if you have any questions in the meantime, uh, you know, there is a, a FAQ document. We've also put up an ICS website and that is updated on a regular basis. So you should have the most accurate information there. So again, for the panelists, thank you very much. Thank you everyone else for participating and hopefully we'll see you again next week and have a great weekend.